to worship on this 18th Sunday following uh, the day of Pentecost. It is our 16th Sunday in our Inquiring Minds uh, worship series, uh, which seems to have been well received by the parish, but I'm still looking for suggestions to carry us up to Advent. And certainly a warm welcome to our internet worshipers who are joining us for the, the month of October here at Mount Olivet. Uh, our prayer is that this will be a time of blessing for you. So uh, this past uh, Thursday we had coffee with a pastor and I told the folks there that, uh, that our virtual choir was going to be singing the the prelude uh, for this morning, and, and it, it created a conversation of reminiscing, uh, which actually we do a lot at Coffee with the Pastor. Uh, we reminisce on things that the church has done in the past, and, but we, we know there's a season for everything. Uh, but we, we thought about that time when we could not meet in person, and there was this this drive of so many people to, to share in the music uh, during our, our virtual worship services. And, and it was a time when, when 
People learned new technology and how to record themselves singing. Uh, and then they learned to get past how horrible they said they sounded <laughs> and, and, and bought into the notion that, that they were one voice among many and that the choir would be incomplete without everyone. And uh, I, I, uh, I revived that song this morning, and it was beautiful, wasn't it? And there was somebody from each one of the three churches uh, singing in there. I'm... I'm even in there, but since I assemble it, I try to mute myself. <laughs> but uh, it's a reminder of, of how far we've come. And so uh, today's Inquiring Minds uh, message is God on the Brain. And I confessed unashamedly that I completely stole that name from an event that I attended recently. That graphic I stole, the graphic on the front of your bulletin I stole, and, and all that will become obvious as we move through worship today. So I invite you now to join me with our call to worship this morning, print in your bulletin. Open the gates of righteousness, the gate of the Lord. So that we can enter through them. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God and has given us his light. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. Now, if you join me in unison with our opening prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the warnings of false prophets and teachers in your word. May you guard the hearts and minds of all your children and protect them from false prophets who seek to devour the flock. Help us all to identify those who come to us in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Lord, give us discernment to know the truth to welcome you into our innermost being, and to honor your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our first lesson this morning is from the Psalms. And I'll be reading Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. The word of God for the people of God. Thank Thanks you, be God. to God. So I, I put this graphic back up. You saw this, uh, oh, two Sundays ago. Um, it reminds us today that uh, we are still uh, engaged with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, back in uh, Matthew 5, where we began three Sundays ago, it tells us that Jesus went up on the side of a mountain and sat down and taught his disciples and the others that were around. And so we continue today with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're now in Matthew chapter 7, and I'll be reading verses 21 through 27. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. 
away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone else who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. These are the words of Jesus, who said, For those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for these words that you have given us. We give you thanks for the ancient words of so long ago that Jesus shared with his disciples. And, and the other people that sat with him to learn on that mountainside. We pray for your presence here today. We pray for your words and your words alone to be spoken here today. We ask this in your name. Amen. So I hope everyone here knows who John Wesley is. I like to refer to him as Mr. Wesley. You know, as much as he never intended of creating a new denomination, because he had always felt that the Methodist movement could exist within the Church of England. But despite that, uh, he soon found that things don't work that way as more and more churches refuse to allow him to preach. And so he, he began to uh, select preachers to send out on the circuits that had developed, the circuits with the uh, Methodist meeting houses, uh, the places where the class meetings were being held. He would send them on horseback to all of these places. He would send them out to preach in the fields and on the roadside. And many of these uh, soon-to-be circuit riders, if not most of them, were laity. Mr. Wesley would interview them. He would examine them. This is the beginnings of our strong background of laity involvement in worship in the Methodist Church today. It's the work of the laity that allows three churches in southern Albemarle County to have their individual worship services every Sunday, even in light of overlapping worship times. <laughs> now, now, Mr. Wesley didn't send these circuit riders out empty-handed. He gave them a book. And the book was titled, The Standard Sermons. These sermons were written by Mr. Wesley himself, and they encompass and expounded upon our Methodist doctrines, our Wesleyan uh, beliefs and theology. There were 53, 53 standard sermons, one for every Sunday of the year. But within these 53 sermons, there were 13 that he called the 13 Discourses. Thirteen sermons were based on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Our gospel lesson today is found in sermon number 33, which was Discourse 13 of the 13. And yes, you might imagine that I conferred with Mr. Wesley this past week by reading his sermon number 33. You see, Wesley saw Jesus' message in this longest sermon that we have from him important enough that it occupies one-fourth of the book of the standard sermons that were given to all of the circuit writers 
uh, back in the early days of Methodism. So today we consider the question from the Sunday school class here at Mount Olivet. What does Matthew 7.21 mean? Now, Mr. Wesley preached on this same uh, uh, passage many times, and often it was not well received. This is what Mr. Wesley writes in his own journal about one of the occasions where he preached on Matthew 7, 21 through 27. After preaching at 8, I went to Mount Savior Gate Church. Towards the close of the prayers, the rector sent the sexton to me that the pulpit was at my service. I preached on the conclusion of the gospel for the day, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. I did not see one person laugh or smile, though we had an elegant congregation. I, I, I don't know what an elegant congregation means, but today you will be the elegant congregation. And, and uh, trust me, I am not Mr. Wesley. <laughs> so you, you might excuse me for wondering this past week, if Mr. Wesley couldn't invoke a better response than that, then what chance do I have this morning? <laughs> In this very important sermon from Jesus, I think it's clear to us that he has presented the way of salvation for us that none of us should ever think that there's any other way to salvation than what Jesus teaches. He uses the word, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He's addressing anyone who thinks of going to heaven by any means other than what he has given us. And that includes, for instance, the creeds that we recite on Sunday morning, our profession of faith, our corporate prayers that we pray together, liturgies that we say in responsive uh, way on Sunday morning, the things that we call the ordinances of God. Every Sunday as this elegant congregation gathers in worship, we speak of God's mighty acts and recount the gift of salvation. But it's very possible that all of these words that we share and repeat during worship, our acknowledgement of a mighty God, it's possible that all of that speech can become nothing more than merely saying to Jesus, Lord, Lord, if they are only words. We might, uh, in our daily lives, avoid what we see as flagrant sins, feel like that we have a good conscience towards God and God's people. We claim to lead a good Christian life. Maybe we include ourselves with the people that uh, the Apostle Paul writes to in Philippians where he says, as to righteousness under the law, we might be blameless. But we still may not be justified. Avoiding those sins just may be another way of saying the words, Lord, Lord. But Jesus, Jesus says that if we go no further than avoiding wrongdoing, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Today we, we celebrate the Lord's table. We join there after we have confessed our sins and our transgressions. Maybe this past week we fed the hungry clothed the poor, maybe even loved a neighbor or two. 
We convince ourselves that God is pleased with our good works. But they themselves can still be another way of repeating the word, Lord, Lord, while glory escapes us. Are we simply going through the motions like a robot? Is there something deeper within us? This is what Jesus is teaching from the side of a mountain. He often repeated the message in his teaching and preaching that no one will enter heaven who doesn't have the kingdom of God within them. Within them. I think Jesus makes it very clear that It's not about doing. It's about being. What does that mean? What does it mean to have the kingdom of God within us? Now, some of you might recall that uh, not this past week, but the week before, uh, I attended an event that was called God on the Brain. Now, very briefly, it was a presentation by a Dr. Andrew Newberg, who is a neuroscientist. He's been conducting research for years now of how one's brain changes during a deeply meditative or spiritual experience. And it's, his science has now been, come to be called uh, neurotheology. Neurotheology. The graphic on the front of today's bulletin are two MRI brain scans. One is called the base scan, and the one to the right is the scan that was taken during a time of deep meditation. There were many other slides shown at the the presentation. The skeptic in me wondered how someone could ever achieve deep meditative state when their head is in the tunnel of the MRI scanner. But the research team had worked out checks and balances and, and, and based uh, much of their interpretation on the narrative of the subject uh, that they wrote later. The scan showed a rather dramatic change in the blood flow to various lobes of the brain during these spiritual encounters. As I, as I listened to Dr. Newberg, who was, who was an incredible speaker, I couldn't help but think about John Wesley and his Aldersgate experience. If you recall, John Wesley was an ordained priest in the Church of England and yet had doubted the assurance of his own salvation for most of his life. He stood on Aldersgate Street and outside of a church and listened to prayers being read and experienced a physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit that he described as his heart being strangely warmed. I think in his sermon, Jesus is telling us that when we cry, Lord, Lord, and truly mean it, we are surrendering ourselves. We become vulnerable before God. Our hearts are strangely warm. We have God on the brain. In Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works. And so we surrender. We surrender acknowledging that we were born sinners. We acknowledge that we have no hope of ever saving ourselves. And instead place all of our hope on being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and cleansed by his spirit. Jesus surrendered all for us as he prayed to the Father, not my will, but yours. 
And he surrendered himself to the cross for us. I think what Jesus is telling us is that good works do not lead to salvation. But salvation leads to good works. It's not in the doing. It's in the being. It's in the motivation, the humbling of ourselves before God. I like to tell people that good works is a side effect of receiving God's gift of salvation. It's a side effect of having God on the brain. Today, Jesus blesses us with an invitation to his table. An invitation to join in a foretaste of a heavenly banquet that awaits those who truly and genuinely say, Lord, Lord. And to God be the glory. Amen. I invite you to retrieve your communion liturgy from your bulletin. Christ does invite to his table all who love God, who are repentant of their sins and wish to be in a true loving relationship with God. So let us confess our sins before God and one another. Father, we never want to hear you say those terrifying words to us, I never knew you. Help us to know you truly and to love you deeply as you designed us to do because you have poured your love into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Break down every wall and every barrier that we put in the way of knowing you. Seize the attention of our hearts from the distractions that we allow to seduce us away from knowing you. We long for your truth to set us free from every hindrance so that our hearts would be united and whole to know and honor you. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. By God's grace, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we raise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who on the night in which he was betrayed, he, he took the bread and gave thanks to you and broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the dinner was over, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do these things, do them in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts through Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of cup and bread, and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So I invite you to reveal the bread in the bottom of your chalice. The body of Christ given for you. And now the juice. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this meal that you have prepared for us. Prepared 2,000 years ago. The meal of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We give you thanks for your love for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. I neglected to mention that this is World Communion Sunday. It's when we recognize that we come to the table with billions of people around the world. So I have some folks awaiting my arrival at Trinity. I hope you will... Reflect with your brain this afternoon and find where God exists inside of your brain, inside of your heart, inside of your soul. I leave you in peace. Okay, we're going to bow our heads for the prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have bestowed on our lives. You have provided us with more than we would ever have imagined. You have surrounded us with people who always look out for us. You have given us family and friends who bless us every day with kind words and actions. We are thankful for our church family and the families they represent. You have provided us the freedom to come and worship you each week. We are thankful for the young persons in our church. We pray that we are good examples for them on their faith journey. We are very thankful that you provide what we need when we need it. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit so that we make better choices each day, and hopefully we are a blessing to others as well. We ask that you take our offerings and bless them to your kingdom and glory, make our gifts blessings to many, and multiply our gifts to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, if you want to stand for the benediction.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.